free to continue eating lunch, but we want to get started so that we can have some good time for interaction. So uh, welcome to the Center for the Study of Global Christianity's Spring Forum. Uh, we Thank you. Uh, we'd like to do a fall forum and a spring forum. It, of course, they haven't been as plentiful lately, and we're just thrilled to be here together face-to-face um, -face like this. So welcome. Uh, the Center for the Study of Global Christianity studies Christianity in every country of the world and produces reference books and answers questions about how many um, Muslims there are in Belgium and how fast are Methodists growing in Botswana and that kind of a thing. So if you have those kind of questions, you can see us afterwards. Okay. But I also want to welcome you to the 33rd annual meeting of the Orlando E. Costas Consultation on Mission and Ecumenism. We're bringing these together this year. Uh, as this implies, there's been more than 30 years, or for more than 30 years, the Boston Theological Institute, now the Boston Theological Interreligious Consortium, has maintained an annual conference uh, honoring the name of Orlando Costas, former academic dean at Andover Newton Theological School. The meeting is an annual project of the Faculty Committee on International Mission and Ecumenism, of which I am a member. Uh, this year, the Costas Consultation is being held in three locations. At Boston College, yesterday we had a wonderful meeting in the afternoon, here at noon, and then later this afternoon at Boston University. This is the first time we've done this, and it seems to be working out really well. Our theme this year is Christian-Muslim Re Relations Today, Traditions and Innovations. Now, Costas was a well-known Hispanic theologian. He served the churches across doctrinal, national, and cultural boundaries. He ministered to the Congregationalists, the Methodists, the Disciples of Christ, and the Baptists. His Puerto Rican origin, training and work in several uh, seminaries in the United States strengthened his commitment to work as a bridge builder between peoples of various traditions and cultures, which is how this particular um, uh, year, year's theme fits really nicely. Uh, Costas focused on work among those who were at the margins of society, suffering oppression, neglect, and exploitation. His work at Andover Newton Theological School here in Massachusetts um, as the Adoniram Judson Chair of Missiology and his outstanding book entitled Christ Outside the Gate, 1982, contributed to a new pattern of missiological thinking. Tragically, he died at the age of 45 in 1987. So these annual consultations keep us reminding Christians to explore the Costas's multifaceted missiological insights and practices. So that's the context of, of what we're doing here. At this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Stephanie Edwards, Executive Director of the Boston Theological Interreligious Consortium, uh, to give a, a, us greetings. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. Um, if I haven't met you yet, I hope to meet you soon. I actually do have a small office here uh, below the library if you're ever looking for me. It's big, it's gigantic, it's very generous, no. Um, I, I'm so happy to be a little bit more formally a part of the Gordon-Conwell family. Um, like Todd said, I am the executive director of the BTI Consortium, acronyms are okay. Um, it is a mouthful and I hope that you know that as students, if you are one, and also as faculty, you have access to the breadth of services, the breadth of courses, the breadth of collaboration that is really deep and historic throughout the 10 member schools and now our new, newest associate member school, the Boston Islamic Seminary, which is just starting out in Chelsea. So we have, as I hope you all know, access to cross-registration and access to certificates that can reflect what you're interested in in seminary. One of those is deeply rooted um, with the International Mission and Ecumenism Certificate and the Costas Consultation. So if this is an area of study that you're really passionate about, know that you can formalize that through a BTI certificate and you can talk to me, Todd, or the IME Commission on that. Um, I would just also like to say how happy I am to be with all of you. <laughs> I started this position just before the pandemic and it's been so wonderful to be able to get out and see your smiling faces and get to know you and build relationships. 
like I started off with, I really do hope you come to see me and I get to know you, and I hope that throughout our learning and being together that we really will achieve our mission of growth and strength of leadership for positive change. So thank you all for being here, and I'll hand it back to Dr. Johnson to introduce our speaker. Thank you, thank you, Stephanie. Okay, in 2006, Trisha, my wife, who's here, and I were meandering down an alley near the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, Turkey. I was looking for something special to take home after two weeks of conferences in one of the world's most enchanting cities. I wandered into a cramped shop of paintings and I spied a small canvas depicting a man hunched over an atlas of the world. I asked the shop owner, who is this? And he replied, Piri Reyes, the world's greatest cartographer. All right, and that's the picture right there. Having just compi been compiling an atlas myself, uh, I purchased the painting and took it home back to Boston. When I did further research, I discovered that Piri Reyes a 16th century Ottoman cartographer had produced the first accurate map of the coast of the United States of America. Uh, well, before it was the United States of America, right? Uh, I hung this portrait above my desk uh, at home, and for the next four years, Reyes, a Muslim, provided a constant inspiration to me as I edited the Atlas of Global Christianity. Tricia will tell you that the portrait is still hanging above my desk. So it means a lot to me. Last spring, I taught a course on history of Christian-Muslim relations and was able to recount the deep and wide collaboration between these two faiths. I also highlighted one of the most profound shifts in a religious affiliation in human history, which is shown on this graph. Um, Christians and Muslims together represented only 33% of the world's population in 1800. By 2020, it's about 57%, and we expect it to surpass 66% sometime before 2100. From one third of the world's population to two thirds. Uh, from the figures below this graph, you can also see that Christians and Muslims are increasingly living as minorities in each other's homelands. So you see there that uh, 7 million Christians lived in countries that were majority Muslim in 1900, 84 million Christians do today, and on the other side, 9 million Muslims lived in countries that were majority Christian in 1900, Today, it's 154 million Muslims. So we're living in closer proximity to, an, to each other, and together we make up soon two-thirds of the world population. So in the middle of the semester of teaching, um, our honored guest today published Reopening Muslim Minds, A Return to Reason, Freedom, and Tolerance. His book was a deep encouragement to me in the quest to understand both common ground and differences between these world's two largest faiths. And I am so pleased today to introduce Mustafa Akyol, senior fellow at the Cato Institute's Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, where he focuses on the intersection of public policy, Islam, and modernity. Since 2013, he's been, also been a frequent opinion writer for the New York Times, uh, covering politics and religion in the Muslim world. He's the author of Why as a Muslim I Defend Liberty, another book, The Islamic Jesus, How the King of Jews Became a Prophet of the Muslims, and Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty. We have all of his books um, in our library. And we're just thrilled that he's going to be with us today. So, um, Mustafa, would you come up and, and speak with us? Uh, good afternoon, and thanks for joining us today. And uh, I should thank my friend, Professor Todd Johnson, for kindly bringing me from DC and arranging this event and a few others at Boston College and Boston University. And, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to see this great, beautiful seminary and meet all the wonderful scholars who are doing amazing work. Now, I'll say a few things about Muslim-Christian relations 
especially from the angle that I'm working, which is religious freedom and, and religious freedom problems within the Islamic tradition, which I do think exist, but their solutions are also found within the Islamic tradition as well. Uh, and just like Christians had to rethink some issues back then in a few centuries ago, whether heretics should be punished or not. And, uh, some Christians didn't have very liberal ideas about those for a while when people were burned at the stake. We have issues in the Muslim world too, but I think they can be sorted out. And what I'm trying to is to highlight the problems and seek the solutions or the inspirations for solutions, which are already in the scripture of Islam or in the traditions of Islam or some, some of the contemporary academic works on these issues. But I'll first tell you a personal story which can elucidate what exactly I'm talking about. And um, that story began in this town. I mean, not Hamilton, I wasn't, I don't know, but Boston area, let's say. Because five years ago when I first met actually uh, Professor Johnston, Johnson, right, yeah. Uh, I was actually a visiting fellow at Wellesley College. So I was living in this area, uh, Freedom Project at Wellesley College. So I got an invitation to go to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, uh, to give public lectures on issues of Islam and freedom and, and, and other toleration, let's say. Why? Well, because Malaysia has been a hub for me in the past 10 years. I've been there five times, spoke to audiences. My books have been translated into Malay. And uh, the people who did that is based, is from an organization called the Islamic Renaissance Front. So it's a pious organization but by pious Muslims, but who have some reformist views towards more, let's say, a, a liberal understanding. Uh, so they said, Mustafa, come again. We organize great lectures for you. People are waiting for you. And I said, like, will I travel to the other end of the planet? Like, again, Kuala Lumpur is really, yeah, like, I said, okay, I'll do it. So I took this flight from Logan Airport uh, to KL, which takes, I don't know, 20 hours or something to go there. Uh, so I went there, and, and the first lecture was on Islamic philosophy and theology. It went well. The second one was on democracy issues. It went well. But the third issue was on a sensitive topic, uh, ridda, as in called in Arabic, or apostasy, right? So... And I gave this 30-minute lecture saying that, hey, look, I'm not an imam or mufti or sheikh. I'm not giving you a religious verdict here. I never claimed that sort of authority. But as a Muslim who's been thinking and researching on these issues, I, I have something to tell. And one is that, yes, our classical jurisprudence, that's the interpretation of sharia, Islamic law, uh, traditionally considered apostasy as a crime punishable by death. But I said... When jurists made those decisions, it was a very different world where an apostate was potentially someone who's going to join the enemy in a context of war. So there was a meaning of a political rebellion and treason uh, to that, which doesn't exist in the modern world. And secondly, I said, well, this whole idea that apostates should be punished, it doesn't exist at all in the Quran. I mean, that's the only undisputed source of Islam. Like blasphemy laws, there's no basis for blasphemy or apostasy laws in the Quran. They come from sayings attributed to Prophet Muhammad, which were written down at least a century after he passed away, and they are disputed. I mean, at least they're disputable. Not everybody disputes them, but I do. I mean. um, and third, I said, well, there's not even a sense to it. I mean, I, I quoted a Quranic verse which reads, La ikraha din, or there is no compulsion on religion. That verse has become, Bakara 256, has become the motto of the liberal-minded Muslims in the past century. You may, you may hear it from Muslims very often. Uh, it's the beginning of one verse. It says, there's no compulsion on religion. Truth has become manifest from error. It goes like that. But that there is no compulsion on religion. That like a very powerful statement of freedom. I mean, no compulsion means freedom. Um, and I said, finally, like, if people don't believe in Islam, what can you achieve by saying, come back, otherwise I'll punish you for apostasy, right? I mean, you can make that person a hypocrite, and that's not what we want, right? That's not true fate. Fate is not, therefore, I said, something you can impose, you can dictate. Fate is not something that you can police. People loved it, a lot of applause, and, you know, and people were leaving, and I was packing, and 
And then five serious gentlemen walked into the hall, five or six of them, and they said, are you Mustafa Akil? I said, yes. They said, did you say religion cannot be policed? I said, yes. They said, good, we are the religion police. <laughs> So they showed me their badges and their job is defined as religion enforcement officer, like that's his job. So they said, we heard complaints about your talk, so they asked me a few questions, who abetted me, why I came here, what's my intention, did I get a permission from the authorities for this lecture? I said, I don't know, I thought, you know, my Malaysian organization invited me, so I just came. Uh, so they said, okay, we'll watch your video, uh, the video of your talk, and we'll let you know about the next steps. And I said, like, what's, what are the next steps? Right? <laughs> then they let me go that night, and I, I slept, and I woke up in the hotel next day in Kuala Lumpur, and I read on the national news that I was summoned to the religious police headquarters to be uh, questioned by a prosecutor. Uh, then my host said, you know what? Just go, you know, you have a flight tonight, take it, and we'll deal with this through lawyers, so you don't have to do it, and you don't have to go there. I said, like, are you sure? He said, yeah, yeah, that's a better idea. I bought souvenirs, to, uh, and then I went to the airport, right? <laughs> and I was getting ready to leave at, uh, I mean, I came to the passport check, and I, I was thinking I'll get a sparkling water in the lounge, but the police officer who saw my name panicked and called some people and they called some people I was watching and then they came and said, we have to take you, sir, you have to come with us. So, so I was detained at the airport and a few hours later, religious police came and they said, you violated the law which bans uh, teaching Islam without tevliya or permission from the authorities. And the punishment for that is two years in jail, so you'll be charged with that. And uh, so we will we'll detain you tonight and tomorrow you'll be taken to the prosecutor. Uh, they bought me a burger, I appreciate that, you know. <laughs> they, were not, they were not like brutal or harsh, but you know. Uh, but you know, it wasn't nice to think that you will be in jail for two years perhaps, right? Anyway, so they took me and uh, they, uh, I mean, I was, I was detained that night in a cell and I was taken uh, next day to the prosecutor. They questioned me for two hours, like, seriously, like, and they said a few times, so did you quote the Quranic verse, la ikraha fid din, no compulsion in religion? I said, yeah, like, I mean, I did, so what's the problem, right? Uh, at the end, they said, they asked a lot of questions. They said, okay, we will let you go. I said, thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate that part, right? Uh, so they really released me a few hours later. So I was detained one day or even like less than a full day. So I was like, go. Oh. But then I was going to the airport. I was saying, like, why were they so uh, obsessed with me quoting there is no compulsion in religion? That's a Quranic course. And well, why was it a problem at all? Then I said, are they doing what some Saudi trans translations are doing, which is to you know, temper the, in the translation a little bit? I said, let me check if they're doing that. Uh, then I went into website of Jakim. That's the religious ministry in Malaysia. And by the way, I should say that Malaysia is mild and moderate on these issues. So it could be much worse things in Iran and so on and so forth. They're milder on the apostasy issue too. They are not giving the death penalty, which is what Saudis and Iranians are doing. But they're sending, sending the apostates to rehabilitation centers. So I said, don't do that either. But, yeah. Anyway, so I checked the Jakim website and I said, let me see how they translate. And I found what I suspected. They are inserting a little few words into the translation. And I'll show you how it goes. Okay. So there is no compulsion in religion. That's the beginning of the words, Bakara 256. But if you read Jakim's translation, it shows a little thing here. As you can see, there is no compulsion in religion in becoming a Muslim. So, that, that's not in the verse itself, like right? They're adding it as an explanation. And of course, what's the difference in there is no compulsion in religion in general, and there's no compulsion in religion in becoming a Muslim only? Well, the implication is you're free to enter, right? But you're not free to exit. Like Hotel California, like Malaysian, <laughs> Malaysian <laughs> liberals jokingly speak about that. And, and for the young people, that was a song when I was like in your age. 
But the thing is, this is not in the verse itself, right? I mean, they're just inserting those. And, and another translation does this, Sahih, uh, sorry, Sahih International. This is published in Saudi Arabia, spread around the world, one of the most popular English translations. They say, there shall be no compulsion in acceptance of the religion. Like, oh, sorry, go back. Still, uh, so this, again, it's a different insertion, but the same meaning. So it's easy to enter, but not, you're not free to exit. So basically, in just the interpretation of one verse, right, you have a clash of two understandings of Islam here. And don't forget that I was not referring to the United Nations or EU, EU decisions or like, and I, I believe in those universal values too, but it, I wasn't making a secular argument for religious freedom. I was making a religious argument for religious freedom. But they were making a religious argument to limit religious freedom, and you know they had to, they had to do this by inserting a few things in the Quran, precisely because the ban on apostasy doesn't come from the Quran; it comes from some hadith sayings attributed to Prophet Muhammad, reported by just one person, written down 150 years later. Who knows it was exactly accurate or not? But just just making who knows saying that will bring a lot of heated reactions from some very strong Hadith uh, defenders because some people think they are not questionable. Uh, and here is a, and one more thing, this verse and others, just not, this is not the only verse in the Quran. There are other verses like, truth is from your Lord, let anyone who want to believe it, who want to believe it and who want to disbelieve it, disbelieve it. Uh, there are verses telling Prophet Muhammad, you're not a compeller over people, your message is, your job is to warn. I mean, not job, but you're, you are to warn. Uh, there are verses which says, if God believed, wanted, everybody on earth would have believed, right? So apparently not, not everyone believes, and that's fine. That's how God, God created humanity with all that diversity. So there are verses like that. Uh, these verses have not attracted that much, that much attention in the Islamic tradition in the Middle Ages, right? Uh, only in the past hundred centuries, this word, this verse became very interesting, right, for Muslims who were seeking for religious freedom, which is a bit similar with, to the fact that the passage in the New Testament where Jesus Christ says, render unto God what is God's, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, wasn't understood as a basis for separation of church and state for centuries, but then some Christians thought, Separation of church and state is a good idea. And by the way, there is there, it's already there, but we didn't see it in that light, right? So that sort of reinterpretive efforts are taking place in the Islamic world since the 19th century. And actually, that verse was used for divine rights of kings. <laughs> uh, Robert Filmer made that argument, and John Locke responds to him in his first treatise uh, of the government, saying that no, it doesn't mean divine rights of kings. So this, seeing new things in, in the scripture, which was already there, but from a different perspective, is, is something that's going on here. But what is the exact nature of the problem we are facing uh, from a religious freedom perspective in Islam, in the Islamic tradition? I'll try to say a few things about that in terms of especially uh, Christian-Muslim relations, uh, because it's, it's a broader topic, of course. Now, let's begin with a few observations about Islam as a religion, right? I mean, it, it was... It was born in Mecca and Medina, these two cities in the Arabian Peninsula, right? Uh, one thing that's important to stress is that before Islam, this part of the world, Mecca and Medina, the Hijaz region of Arabia, it was a pagan polytheistic part of the world. So Arabs were worshippers of idols. The Kaaba, that cubicle building in, in Mecca, it was a pagan pantheon that were like, love god and war god and agriculture god and tribes of deities and so on and so forth. Um, be, around these polytheistic Arabs, there were some monotheists, especially Jews in Medina. So some Arabs were like thinking, monotheism looks cool, but you know, it's theirs, right? I mean, we don't, we don't have it. Uh, so one of the Arabs, one day in the city of Mecca, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as we believe, heard the voice in a cave, very like Moses-like story, that he didn't know what would happen until that moment, but on the mountaintop, he hears this divine telling him, recite in the name of God who created men, and recite Ikra, that became the Quran. I mean, the Quran comes from that very word, the recitation. 
Uh, and that was the beginning of, of I mean, but the, the interesting thing is, first, first reaction, he was scared. He didn't know what this was. Right? He was 40 years old, he was a successful merchant, he wasn't looking for trouble, but trouble found him, right? I'm blessing, but secular perspective trouble, <laughs> metaphysically blessing. Right? Um, he was scared, he didn't know. He went to his home, to his wife Hatija, and said, this is what happened to me, the jinn probably attacked me. Jinns are genie, you know, these demons. And his wife Hatija said, let's go and ask Waraka, a figure in Medina called Waraka. And you know what the Islamic tradition tells us about this sage in the city? He was a Christian writing with Hebrew letters. Judeo-Christian of some sort, but we don't know exactly what that means. I, I don't know what kind of Christian he was. I can tell you he wasn't Southern Baptist or, you know, <laughs> Presbyterian, but maybe he was Nestorian, we don't know. So, so Prophet Muhammad comes and tells a story and Waraka listens to him and he says, you're not a madman. The, the angel that spoke to you is the same angel that spoke to Moses before. You are the Moses that is sent to your people, right? And Prophet Muhammad says, okay, you know, that, that, that assures him. So it's amazing that the assurance of Prophet Muhammad came from first time in history from a Christian, Baraka. Uh, and it's in basic Islamic textbooks. I mean, it's, it's a known story, but, you know, people don't see the significance sometimes uh, of that. So that's the first encounter between Islam and Christianity, right? Uh, and then what happens is in the next 13 years, Islam spreads in Medina, first silently, then publicly, and Muslims face a, an age-old problem, which is religious persecution, because they offend the religious sensibilities of the pagans, right? They're defying the gods as you know, false gods, and, and that brings on them persecution. A few Muslims are killed by their slave owners because they're slaves. Uh, others are harassed and threatened. And ultimately, in the fifth year of the first revelation, Prophet Muhammad sends some of the weak members of the community, says, migrate, escape from here, and go to another place. And that other place was the Christian kingdom of Ethiopia, where there's a Christian king, Negus, uh, and he, Najashi, as it's known in Islamic tradition. Uh, and Muslims go there, and Prophet Muhammad says, there's a just king, you will go and find safety there. And they do. Muslims escape there. The king says, who are you? We're monotheists, we believe in God. He asks them about Jesus. They say, we believe that he was born of a virgin and he was the Messiah. And the Christian king says, good, come on, <laughs> come on. I mean, yeah, very close, right? There are differences, obviously. Islam rejects the doctrine of Trinity, so there's a tension there. But Islam also honors, the Quran honors Mary, uh, the only woman named in the Quran, and after whom there's a chapter, the Quran confirms the virgin birth of Mary, uh, calls Jesus repeatedly Messiah, that's Messiah, or Christ in, in the Greek term. Uh, the Quran even calls Jesus word of God, and Muslims traditionally were puzzled what this means. Of course, if you know the fourth gospel, you see something meaningful in this. Uh, that's not exactly the step we take, but you know, the word is there, the word of God. And nobody is called word of God other than Christ, Jesus Christ uh, in the Quran. Uh, so anyway, th that's the second encounter, being finding safe heaven in, in the Christian kingdom of Ethiopia. By the way, this shows that you, for a just state, you don't, want, you don't need the state to be Islamic because his state was not an Islamic state, it was a Christian state, but a Christian state can be a just state, or, or I don't know, maybe Jewish state, or I don't know, Hindu state, but justice is something that is beyond any particular religion. Uh, or a separation of church and state state. You know, so let's see, that's not a bad model. Yeah. Um, so, and the persecution continues, and ultimately Prophet Muhammad gets close to being assassinated by the pagan leaders in the city. And he makes his historic hijra. So he and all the believers leave in peril, in, in threat of being murdered and killed, from Mecca to another city called Medina. Now, here's a question. Does this sound like any scriptural story that you've heard before? 
like a group of believers persecuted in one place and making an exodus to another place. <laughs> you got it. It's very similar to the Moses story, right? Therefore, it's no accident that Moses is the most dominant figure in the whole Quran. If you read, I'll tell you a story. If a Christian friend of mine once asked me about a car, can I read a Quran? I said, yeah, I gave him a copy. He read, and he said, I was reading, expecting to learn about Muhammad. I learned nothing about him. I learned about Moses all the time. I said, yes, because the Quran speaks about Moses more than anybody else. Because the Quran speaks not about Muhammad, but to Muhammad. And to, to inspire him and to encourage him, it repeatedly tells the story of Moses and the Pharaoh, especially in the Meccan surahs, where the Pharaoh is identified with the pagan oppressors, and, and Prophet Muhammad and Moses himself are identified with the Israelites, right? They were oppressed, but God saved them, and ultimately that bad man was drawn in the water, and so on and so forth. Uh, and he repented at the last moment. There's a detail that the Quran adds, you know, which you don't have. Because, the, the, by the way, that's a footnote, but the, also the Quran wants to convert the Pharaoh into monotheism, which is not a theme you find in the, in the Bible. But anyway, that's, that's a side note. That's for another book that's coming. But, but. <laughs> but also, let's not forget, after Exodus, uh, the Mosaic Israelite story gained some new complications, right? There's some tribes that attack them and they fight back. The Amalekites, you know, the, the Philistines, the, some of the pagan groups there. There are bitter fights, and there are some harsh passages about that in the Old Testament, right? If you read the book of Joshua, the conquest of Canaan, there are some violent things that happen. Something similar happens in the second phase. After Hijra, you have a, a permission given to Muslims to fight. First time. Until that point, Muslims had ne used never weapons or any anything. But that comes, and I'll show you that. Oh, by the way, this is, the, this is a miniature showing Prophet Muhammad receiving the first revelation in a, in a mountaintop, and angels are there. His face is covered because avoiding idolatry, I think, was the basic idea behind covering his face. No God but the God, that's, this, that's the message. But let's go there. Okay, let's... Actually, I didn't put that to, to these slides. Sorry, I'm confused about the slides. I'll tell you the story anyway. Uh, after Hijra comes a Quranic verse, because the, the properties of the Muslims are plundered, their homes are raided after they leave. So they started, they attack some caravans to get their properties back. That ignites a war between Mecca and Medina. So the last 10 years of Prophet Muhammad is full of battles. The Battle of Petra, Battle of Uhud, Battle of Hendek, the pagans come. And the, interestingly, there are Jews in the Medina city, first they make a con constitution with Muslims, which is very interesting. It says to Muslims their religion, to Jews their religion. Unfortunately, this collapses and Jewish tribes are expelled from Medina, at least three of them, maybe others remained. But not for political, for political reasons, with the fear that they're allying with the enemy, not for religious reasons, because Islam still considers Judaism and Christianity as sister monotheisms. Uh, and there are many examples of this. I mean, the Quran says, you're, you, you will never eat the food of the pagans, but you can eat the food of Jews and Christians because they're not slaughtering them for idols, right? Well, pork makes it complicated from the Christian point of view, but if it's halal, it's perfect. I mean, if it's, something is kosher, it's halal. I mean, it's good for Jews, it's good for us. So th there's no doubt about that. Uh, Muslims can marry Jewish and Christian women, but not pagans. So it's, it's all there in the Quran. So there is this idea that there is some monotheistic umbrella, which if Islam represents the best, you know, I mean, always the newcomer has to say that. But, but the others are not totally, you know, uh, uh, illegitimate. That idea is there. And we see this, interesting, there, no there is no battle with the Christians until, there is a battle of Hunayn in which there are some tribes afflated with Rome. Enter, but generally there's no conflict with the Christians as much as certainly with the pagans and some with the Jewish tribes there. But there's a very interesting interaction between Christians and Muslims in the last year of Prophet Muhammad at 631, that a year before he dies. Christians from a place called Najran, that's south of Arabia, come to Medina to learn about this new religion, right? They come as a delegation and uh, they come to Prophet Muhammad's mosque and the prophet welcomes them, 
Then he says, you can pray here when your prayer time comes. They do towards Jerusalem, but not Mecca. Of course, there are different directions there. Uh, which would be unthinkable today, because in Saudi Arabia, as a Christian, you cannot even step on the Hijaz, Mecca and Medina, right? Uh, there is actually, if you've been there, I mean, it says the last exit for non-Muslims non on a highway, like you, you are not supposed to enter there, which came as a later interpretation, but actually in the prophet's practice, Christians were welcome in the place. And then they have disputes, you know, I mean, uh, Muslims are saying Jesus is not God, but we respect him. They said, no, he's divine. You should, I mean, those things happen. But at the end, they sign a treaty. Uh, Prophet Muhammad says the Christians of Najran are given freedom. They will remain as Christians. They have to pay trib tribute, some taxes to Medina because it's become a state at this uh, point. So in this letter given to Najran Christians by Prophet Muhammad, we read Najran has the protection of God and the pledges of Muhammad, the Prophet, to protect their lives, faith, land, and property. They need not change anything of their past customs. No right of theirs or their religion shall be altered. No bishop, monk, or church uh, guard shall be removed from his position. So Islam is expanding here as a political entity. So it's, it's, it's different from the Christ story. It's like a Jewish kingdom is spreading in the uh, ancient Israelite model. But Christians are given the right to practice their religion. Soon after this, Muslims, a few years after Prophet Muhammad passes, Muslims take another important place, way important than Najran, Jerusalem, right? Muslim armies conquered Jerusalem uh, in the time of Caliph Umar, which would be several years after the Prophet. I mean, probably five, six years probably after the Prophet. Uh, and uh, they, they take the city. What they do is they don't destroy the churches. They don't touch the Christians. Uh, that's why you still have Christian churches in Jerusalem, which, which lived under Islamic rule for, from the 7th century to the 19th, 20th century, actually, at the end of the Ottoman Empire uh, until 1918. So all the Christian institutions remain, churches remain. And, 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 uh, now, one, because Islam saw Judaism and Christianity as monotheisms, fellow monotheisms, and tolerated them, even if it began like an empire. However, and that's something to honor and appreciate there. And this, you know who, who appreciated this most in human history? Jews. Because they were often persecuted in Christian Europe, when Christian Europe was not very liberal. You know, there was a time that, of the Inquisition and, and all those forced conversions and pogroms. Jews repeatedly fled from Europe to the lands of Islam. I mean, the most iconic example is Sephardic Jews who were persecuted by the Catholic uh, Inquisition in the middle of the 15th century, time of Columbus. They fled from Spain to North Africa, to Istanbul, my hometown. So we have a Sephardic community coming from Spain since. Uh, because for Ottomans, I mean, you're people of the book. I mean, and, and sometimes heretical Christians preferred Muslims because for Muslims who is heretical didn't matter. I mean, these are all Christians, they are doing their thing, right? But you know, for heretic, if you're a heretical Christian, you know, you would escape. There are Unitarians which fled to the Ottoman Empire. And, uh, and we know that some, uh, some Islamic conquests were welcomed by Christian churches that were oppressed before by the Byzantines because the Byzantine was imposing their own doctrine. And there were, because endless, this, you know better, I mean, the nature of Christ, is it one, I mean, all that, you know, very complicated theological disputes there. Some were seen as heretical. So, um, but this was tolerant for its time, but it was not equal, right? Muslims made sure that they are superior. So we speak about supremacy today. It was supremacy, Islamic supremacy. So Jews and Christians were tolerated, but they didn't have equal rights. So people could convert to Islam, but they couldn't convert back, which is apostasy, right? Uh, so Muslims could say whatever they want about other religions, but they could not offend Islam. So you had blasphemy laws. So this whole legal structure developed under Islamic empires. And that's what we broadly call the Sharia. I mean, is it fiqh? Fiqh is the human interpretation of the Sharia. There's a technicality there. 
But ultimately, what Muslims mean when we mean by the Sharia, it is religious practice like halakha, you know, eating, so there's no problem about that, your personal uh, pr uh, practice. But there's a political side to it. That's the religious law of the Islamic empire. You know, that's what gave us the tradition that we broadly call the Sharia. Uh, in that sense, Islam is very close to Judaism. So Sharia and halakha are actually very similar uh, traditions. That's like why, you know, kosher is halal for us. I mean, no pork, boys are circumcised, a lot of similarities. Uh, but there's one difference. Jews didn't, Jews haven't had a theocratic state for the past 2,000 years, right? So halakha, by definition, became a voluntary communal code. I mean, community itself wasn't 100% voluntary until the Enlightenment, but... It wasn't a state law, at least. Then modern, the modern era became growingly individual, uh, at least in the West as well. Whereas in Islam, this, the connection between the state and the Sharia continued. So that's why today we have an Islamic tradition, in my view, which is of course rooted in the divine revelation and so on, but also took shape in human history and under imperial conditions. That's why I say we have a problem of imperial jurisprudence. Blasphemy laws, apostasy laws, inequality laws, that Christians are not equal with Muslims. They have to pay an extra tax. Their testimony is not the same with Muslims. And this has continued until the modern era. And this was in the 15th century when you were escaping from the Spanish Inquisition. This was good, actually, right, compared to the alternatives. But in the modern era, with the idea of equal rights, because everything is comparative. So this looks now, that, that's not acceptable. And Muslim and, and Christian minorities began to demand equal rights in the 19th century in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Ottomans actually accepted that. That's very interesting. And with the Ottoman Constitution of 1876, the Ottoman declared all Ottomans, regardless of religion, equal. And that was an amazing thing. I mean, it happened under the caliphate. But it was also reversed because there was reaction to it, and Christians want independence anyway, so that experiment collapsed. But today, there are still Islamic groups, Islamists especially, who think Muslims are superior and others are tolerated. But know the limits, and these limits will be reminded by blasphemy, apostasy, and, and all those kind of things, which leads to a lot of human rights violations today in, from Pakistan to Malaysia to, to Saudi Arabia, you name it. In, in, but not all parts of the Muslim world, I should also say that. I mean, there are a lot of Muslim countries whose constitutions are secular and whose religious freedom levels are actually quite okay. I mean, at least not maybe perfect, but probably the best ones are Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, Albania, uh, Sierra Leone is not bad, or Senegal, sorry, Senegal is not bad. Uh, Indonesia is getting good, you know, and, and it's, uh, but it, it's a diverse scene there, but there are problems. And there are about a dozen Muslim majority states where Sharia defines a criminal code, and uh, that is bringing us some of these problems. So let's continue. Let me see. Oh, this map, this map shows how Islam spread as an empire. In one century, from Spain to, uh, to India, uh, all the way. And so this jurisprudence took under this condition. Now, here's one question I think we Muslims need to discuss, and we do discuss. And that is, was this imperial drive to build an empire of fate with, with swords, basically? But not still tolerating the people there, but you bring the law. I mean, you are... You liberate them, right? You know, it's, it's a terminology we know. You bring them civilization. So the West did it in more modern term, later as colonialism. Was this a divine blueprint? Was this the will of God that Muslims were following? Or is it just human history? Because Christians were doing the same thing at the time. Byzantine Empire was also spreading. So my answer is that it was human history. But of course, there are people who will not fully agree with that. You know, they will think that expansion was the divine goal. Uh, we have apostasy laws, blasphemy laws, inequality laws, church conversions. That's an interesting thing, which you mentioned Hagia Sophia, uh, Todd. In, so Hag when Hagia Sophia was convert reconverted to a mosque in 2020 summer, yeah. I wrote a piece in the New York Times, would Prophet Muhammad convert Hagia Sophia? Uh, I mean, in Turkey, it was hated. They, I was vilified as a traitor to the nation by one of the leading newspapers, one of the proudest, if you will. But 
But I ask a question, I mean, the Ottomans, yes, converted Hagia Sophia. It was the world's greatest cathedral at that point, and they converted into a mosque. This whole idea that mosques, shape, uh, churches can be converted, you don't find it in the Quran at all. You don't find it in the prophetic practice. You find it in the imperial Islamic practice. And this was what everybody was doing at the time, right? I mean, Christians were how many pagan buildings they converted. That's what everybody at the time, nobody found a problem in that. So I said, maybe it was understandable they, they did it back then, but th this is not an Islamic idea. Let's actually, my, my theory about uh, Hagia Sophia has been from the early 2000s. Let's share it, you know. We can have Friday and they can have Sunday mass. And there are examples of that in Islamic history. Shared, uh, it, Damascus mosque was actually, the, the great mosque in Damascus, which was a cathedral of Damascus, was actually shared in the first few decades. Uh, I mean, you, it's hard to arrange that, but you can, I mean, if you want to. So, uh, but anyway, so what I, the idea of a converting the church into a mosque came as an imperial policy. It does not base in the Quran and, and so on and so forth. Of course, others think that, you know, the true religion should be manifested by showing its power. Uh, whereas you can say the true religion should be manifested by showing its principles and tolerance, not, not power. But these are different ways of asserting, you know, your, your values. And hispa, that is religious policing, and Malaysians love that. I mean, if you're drinking wine, you know, you'll be flogged a little bit or you know, that, that kind of stuff. So that's religious policing. That's a part of this imperial jurisprudence, which you don't really find in the very basic sources of Islam. So my argument is we can rethink these legal things. But they're not meant to be preserved in the first place. And there are a few issues in which actually Muslims accepted this by and large, the Muslim community. Slavery, slavery was a part of Sharia until the 19th century. It was abolished luckily, not easily, but you know, with a lot of efforts. Now, do, even the conservative, most conservatives will say, well, slavery was not something Islam wanted. It was just there when Islam came. So Islam wanted to eliminate it in the long run. So it took a while until the 19th century, but conditions matured. And, because there are verses in the Quran which praise liberating a slave. I mean, one of the pious acts defined in one of the early chapters of the Quran is freeing a neck, which means kept, uh, liberating a slave is praised in the Quran as a pious act. It's not abolition as a system, but it's a pious act as liberating somebody. So could that translate into abolition as a system? Finally, some people said yes, and we went there, but it took a while, so sometimes mindset changes over time, but so since we've able to do this in, in slavery, we can do this in, in other other issues as well. So that's basically my the core of my argument, but you got into a lot of details while saying this. And if we do this, what is the proposal? What's the, what's the vision of Islam? Well, I, my answer is in this sense, simple. We'll just accept there is no compulsion in religion. I mean, that, that we'll just fully accept what this means. Like there's no apostasy laws and no blasphemy laws. People are pious because they believe in, not because they're forced to do so. Women are cover themselves if they want to, and not because the government tells them to cover, or not that the government tells them to uncover as they do in France, right? So we have two, two different problems, but similar problems here. Uh, so let it, leave it to the individual conscience and communities, but no compulsion, it's right there in the Quran. One more thing regarding Christians and Muslims and let's say other religious tradition, there's also a very interesting perspective in the Quran that, that we need to cultivate, I think, in, in Islamic tradition and all traditions. And that, that's a very interesting passage in Surah Maida. By the way, Surah Maida means the table. That is a table where Jesus has his last feast. I mean, it's ma'ad, it comes from the Ethiopian word, uh, actually, because the Quran tells a story something like the Last Supper. It's not exactly the same story, but people think it's a same, similar story. But Jesus br brings a feast. The name of the surah comes from that. And anyway, anyway, that's a detail. But in Surah Maida, there is a passage where God says, God first sent Moses and gave the Jews their Torah, and then came the Christians, and now Muslims. And then it says this. If, if God had so willed, he would have made all of you one community. But he has not done so in order that he may test you according to what he has given you. So compete in doing good. To God, 
shall you all return, and he will tell you the truth about what you have been disputing. So it says amazing things here. If God wanted, there would be just one people, right? Just everybody would be Salafi or Shia or Southern Baptist, or, but no, he wanted everybody to be different. Uh, I mean, not, not, nothing against Southern Baptist, just, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's very American, I just want to say that. It wasn't there in so. so. It could be Nor Northern Presbyterian too, whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, but he created this diversity, racial, ethnic, or religious, right? So that you may compete with each other in not killing each other, like in doing good, which also means everybody can do good, right? The other guys can do something good as well. It's not that goodness is just limited to your community or your worldview. And we have disputes. There are things we will never fully agree on, right? I mean, exact nature of Christ, Muslims and Christians will not agree on that. I'll, just a hint, Muslims like lower Christologies generally thinking it, it works for them. But I know it's, it's a very uh, diverse issue in Christianity. Uh, we might not never agree. So what are going to do all these disagreements? It says, God will let you know, sort it out. I mean, just po actually there is a theology in Islam called murjia theology. It means postponing. Postpone the dispute to afterlife to be resolved by God. It was created uh, to solve the problem between these proto-Sunni and proto-Shia killing each other for theological reasons. The Murjia said, we don't know, but let's postpone this to God to solve it. So we can do the same thing, postpone theological disputes and have conversations about them, of course, too, but there are things, there will be differences not to be solved, but let, let God sort us and educate us about them, you know, when we here maybe too, but certainly in afterlife, inshallah, as we say. Well, that's all I want to say. Thank you so much for your attention, and thanks for being with us. I'm going to join you for a minute, and then we'll have questions. Okay, we're going to have questions in a minute, but we have a, a, a little exciting prize that we're going to give away here, which is uh, Mustafa's latest book, uh, Reopening Muslim Minds. And the way we're going to do it, uh, Mustafa celebrated his birthday on February 20th. So the person with the birthday closest to or on February 20th, uh, who do we have here? Oh. Nobody had a birthday in February? 28th? What, what's yours? First? No, no, no. Okay. 28th. 24th. No. No, that doesn't count. You have to be present. Yes, my mother's birthday is near, but I'm not giving it to her. Okay, so, okay, so. But, but you can order from Amazon. Yeah, <laughs> there we go, there we go. Okay, so, and he will sign it for you after the meeting. Congratulations. Okay, we'll, we'll take questions now. And I, is there a mic that's going around? Yes, please. And you can just Thank you so much uh, for a wonderful presentation. I have a question about Turkey. Oh, okay. uh, you know, the that's first, sad, yeah. yeah. The first time I went to Turkey, I was really struck by how proud they were of the, um, the secularization under Ataturk and how they had put behind them uh, so many of the, uh, the conflicts that seemed to have reemerged uh, and things like the, the conversion of the Haji Safi, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I wonder what's your perception of the situation in Turkey? Is this a season it's going through, or do you think that the, the Ataturk uh, reforms are now ancient history? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We could have another lecture on, of course, uh, Turkey, my uh, beloved and troubled country these days. and. Um, Here's one thing, uh, you said Turks were proud of Ataturk reforms. Perhaps you spoke to a certain group of Turks, right? Because there are people who think not great about you know, those reforms. And uh, I'm being more nuanced about this whole Ataturkist Kemalist legacy that Turkey had. Uh, Atat Ataturk is Turkey's founder, you know, uh, first president until he passed away from 1923 to, uh, he was like war hero turned president. 
I wish he read more Jefferson rather than Montesquieu. Uh, no, Jefferson rather than Voltaire, sorry, right? He was so influenced by the French Enlightenment and the idea that religion is a problem and it has to be curbed. So his secularism was a top-down secularism, which had brought, which had good ideas, like equal rights for women. So he, he did some great things too. And secularization of law itself is, I think, was important and great contribution. But also, it went too far as secularism, like banning Sufi orders and, and religious institutions. So it was a illiberal secularism. And we call it laïc. It's, it's from laïcité, the same word. So it got, he was deeply influenced by the French tradition in which um, religious freedom is not as cherished, I think, as in the American tradition. So uh, what happened is that his reforms were embraced by a part of society, but the other part saw this as an intrusion to their way of life and the conservatives, right, generally. Also Kurds, for different reasons. For Kurds, it was a nationalist because he was a very Turkish nationalist, and as I said, the Ottomans were not Turkish nationalists, but from, it was a transition from empire to... So Turkey, for 100 years almost now, has been dealing with two, two reactions to the republic, either Kurdish reac reaction to the republic or the Islamic reaction to the republic. And ultimately, the Islamic reaction to the republic take over, <laughs> took over the republic. I mean, what happened in the past 20 years basically is that, uh, and under Erdogan. And Erdogan, uh, President Erdogan, uh, I was sympathetic in the beginning when he was doing some EU reforms and, 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 some, uh, and they were saying, we just want to correct some of the excesses of the of former regime, but freedom for everybody. It gradually boiled down to some narrow populism, us versus them, and a re sense of revenge from the old elites, and, and it got growingly bad, right? Now Turkey's in a pretty, I think, uh, disappointing situation in terms of his freedom of speech, especially. Uh, there are still elections, and whether they matter or not, they probably still do, but there are now questions about that. Uh, but. It's very divided and, and authoritarian in, in many ways. So my hope, and one more thing, President Erdogan is depicting himself as the second Ataturk, which put things in the right order, right? Ataturk was a Westernist. He's the new savior of the Turks, but by restoring the old glory, making Turkey great again, and you know, oh. and Ottoman again, and Islamic again, right? And not explicitly, it's still not an Islamic Republic or anything, but he's bringing religion to the public square and using it very much so. And he's triggering a secular reaction, by the way, by, by doing that. Uh, my hope for Turkey is that, my belief is that Ataturk did great things, but his secularism went too far and some excessive results, such as not allowing a Muslim woman to wear a headscarf and get to uni university, right? I mean, that was the kind of obsessive secularism, which was wrong. That created a backlash on which Erdogan has been surfing, and that's the other extreme. I hope to have a third Turkey finally, where nobody is the under, where nobody is the enemy within, where the republic isn't just the castle or the citadel of just one group against the other. A more liberal, pluralist Turkey, where people who wear the headscarf or miniskirt and all that, you know, can live, and and that's. Harder to establish than done. I mean, even look at the culture wars in the U.S. I mean, and that's they're milder compared to Turkey. I'll tell you, but but so but w whether we will get there or not, I'm not sure. I hope. I mean, there should be an end to Erdogan era of some sort. I mean, I don't know when. I don't know how. Uh, but that's what I hope for Turkey. And I think the Ataturk legacy has parts that we have to preserve has parts that had to be rectified somehow, but Erdogan used that need for rectification to create the counter-revolution, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, which, which gives him power and glory and, you know, and, and all that, you know, a thousand room palace or that kind of stuff. Yeah. I don't know if this answers this question, but... And one thing, Turkey's religious freedom record also has not been great on Christian minorities. Uh, in the Republican era, in the secular era, not because of Islam or religious sentiments that much, but because of nationalism, right? Because in Turkey, in countries in Turkey and around, religion is also who you are as an ethnicity, right? 
Uh, if you're a Turk, you're a Muslim by definition. You can be an atheist, but you are still Muslim atheist, right? I mean, <laughs> even in Ireland, there's a joke about that, actually. You know, I don't know, in Northern Ireland, one man was walking, IRA militants stopped him, and they said, are you a Protestant or Catholic? The man said, I'm an atheist. But they said, are you a Protestant atheist or a Catholic atheist? Right? <laughs> So in those parts of the world, in America, it doesn't work that way. Americanness is a constitutional citizenship. But in Bulgaria, being Bulgarian is related with the Bulgarian church and that identity and so on and so forth. So when you convert, you're losing your national identity as well too. So Turks, Turkey has not been very good for its Christian minorities in the 20th century under the Ataturkist rule, not because of religion per se, but because they are the fifth column of Greece and Greece is suppressing the Turks there, so we have to suppress them here instead of liberating all of them. I mean, that stupid idea of we hurt your people and you hurt their people and just this, this has been a problem, I think. There's a wonderful series in Netflix, if you are a Netflix watcher, called The Club these days. It shows how Turkish nationalism uh, had you know, oppressive results on Jews, especially in the 1950s. It's very beautifully done, too. I, I would recommend ch checking that. Hope that ma makes sense of some sort. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. So I was in Egypt in a small village and um, surrounded by... Umm uh, Dunya. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank the you. The mother of the world. <laughs> um, and then, so I have listened a lot to, um, you know, um, lectures of this kind from both sides, from uh, the more liberal side and from the very conservative side. And then you see a lot of, uh, a huge flow for, uh, of Wahhabism coming to Egypt from Saudi Arabia and then the Muslim Brotherhood playing into power and all of that. And then you see the, uh, the University of Al-Azhar uh, creating curriculum and it's changing over the years. And it feels like there is a big divide between the liberal uh, Islamic view of the world and, and other religions and this educational institute, which is very influential all over the world because a lot of Muslim scholars go learn there. So um, is, is this the case? Is, is what's being projected in that environment correct? Or is there more of a connection and communication between this liberal view and an, inst an institute like Al-Azhar? Uh, you see the liberal view within Azhar or against Al-Azhar? Against Al-Azhar. Al yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Well, I mean, you probably know Egypt better than me, but what I know is, uh, I mean, there's an incredible spectrum in, in all Muslim world, right? I mean, there's Wahhabis, Salafis typically are the far right, I mean, the most, most rigid end of the spectrum, and their violent versions called Salafi jihadists are the, that's the beyond the pale, that's ISIS, Al-Qaeda you know, path, right? So that, that is the most extreme line. Then there's Salafis that are, not necessarily violent, but they're very rigid. And then there is a Sunni mainstream orthodoxy presented by al Asar, which on some issues, you know, they take some modifications, you know. I mean, al Asar actually on apostasy said, you know, ap apostate, people will be considered as apostate not because just losing the faith, but by being an enemy of Muslims, right, something like that. But what does being an enemy of Muslims mean, right? Writing a book, a critical of Islam, does that count? I mean, those some people, that's what they mean, and I don't think that's a very liberal position yet. And so, and of course, then so that's the orthodoxy. But then in the Sunni world, for example, if you look at Rashid Ganushi in Tunisia, he's taken more liberal positions on these issues. So that's also conservative Sunni Islam, but it has a spectrum there. And then you have the people like me called the liberal reformists and. What we're trying to do is to look into the text and the context and uh, question hadiths, their authenticity, and trying to make Islam compatible with human rights and, as defined in the modern sense. Uh, that is not what al Azhar will do on issues, but you still prefer al Azhar to hardcore Salafis, especially Salafi jihadis. And the thing is, Terrorism attracted a lot of attention, obviously, from Al-Qaeda, ISIS line. So that's the biggest problem, no doubt about that. But that's actually a very small segment. The, the mainstream is not like anything like terrorists at all, but 
illiberal on some of these issues, right? I mean, they're not on religious freedom. They have limitations on women's issues, right? You know, women's rights. So, and what's the scene in the Islamic world? It, in every country, the spectrum, you go there, Egypt, the, every, the spectrum exists in almost every country, but the way it changes, right? If you come to Turkey, even the most conservatives will not go that far, whereas in Egypt, they go that far. In Saudi Arabia, of course, that's the water everybody drinks. But if you go to Indonesia, there is more. So it's, it's a diverse. There's a great, if you want to see Muslim attitudes, there have been great polls by the Pew Research uh, Center in DC. Like Muslim communities were asked questions like, this was like seven, five, seven, six years ago. Do you think like adulterers should be stoned, right? Uh, I think more than 55% of all Egyptians say yes, although it's not in the law in Egypt, by the way, but you know, they think it's, it should be. And Pakistanis say yes. The same question you ask that in Albania, like 0.3% say yes, but although that's, a, so it's a very different history, very different. It's so past, like gone, that, I mean, they don't think that people will be stoned. That they, they're used to an Islamic tradition, those things are not even discussed, right? I mean, considered. So political trajectories of societies uh, are very different. Or if you go to Central Asian countries, you have political totalitarianism, but women's rights is generally not a problem. You know, they, they, they accepted that because of the communist heritage. But So it's very diverse like that. But your observations are right. I mean, LSR is, I prefer LSR to the most dangerous guys, but I have issues with LSR, and I'm sure they will have issues with me too, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks so much. Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you all for coming. There, there. You know, the lightning struck the other building, so we actually have wow, not really? not today, not today, no. Yeah. Um, but uh, we have to move out in the next ten minutes or so. I thought religious and, police came or something. No, no religious police. <laughs> um, so um, thank you all for coming, and we'll gradually move out. And Mustafa, if you can just be around to answer yes. some personal questions, and then we will have to go out by about one thirty or so. Thank you. <laughs>